Our, um, our sermon series, Finishing Strong, really has two meanings. One is, uh, of course, our focus on perseverance, but the other is aiming at our capital campaign, our transformed campaign. <clears throat> we um, began this in the spring, uh, certainly had been planning for many years, postponed it a couple of times, uh, uh, began in the spring, and then took a pause uh, through the summer and as the pandemic continued to, um, to rage on. And we've um, uh, begun it again just last week, and uh, I, we had the opportunity to find out so much more about this community center that we intend to build. Um, I hope you can see the picture if you're watching online, and there's a picture in your bulletin here in the sanctuary. Um, last week, I told you that we were at $19 million towards our goal of $23 million. And um, uh, this church is so amazingly generous, I'm just overwhelmed. Uh, we now are closer to $20 million, so we're just uh, right there. We can get there if we'll all work together. Um, these are three-year pledges, and we'd love to invite you to uh, uh, support this. You know, it was in 2013 that we made a decision to build, uh, had a capital campaign raise just almost $40 million as we uh, were building, uh, expanding our facilities here and building a, a youth building, a student ministry building here on this campus for the, the families that are here in our congregation and, and neighbors around us. And most of everything we did was for, really for our own congregation here. Uh, but this is really tied to our DNA of being a congregation that wants to reach out to our community. And um, so this community center is the lion's share of this, of this campaign. It's a student, has a student ministry building just like, almost just like the one we have here. It's got a few differences, uh, as, as well as gymnasium, uh, a, a um, commercial kitchen, a, a really a teaching kitchen for PX Project, which is our workforce development program, a place for revision, our work with a gang affected young people, uh, young people in the juvenile justice system or at risk. It's just uh, really a place for amazing things to happen. So I just uh, wanted you to see the, the rendering. I found it so exciting this week and um, encourage you to think and pray about whether you'd like to support it. You can go to stlukestransformed.org and see all of the information about it. And there's a video and um, each, each project has a little tab you can get the details on. And I uh, just hope you'll take some time and think and pray about whether God's uh, uh, calling you to support this. Let's join together in prayer. Oh God, open us up. Open our eyes that we might see and our ears that we might hear. Open our hearts that we might feel. And then, oh Lord, open our hands that we might serve. Amen. <clears throat> the Tour de France is the premier men's bicycle race uh, in the world. Um, it was begun in 1903, has been run every year, mostly in the summer, um, ever since, except for during World War I and World War II when France was occupied and uh, they were unable to, uh, uh, to race. It is 21 stages over 23 days. It goes 2,200 miles, basically, uh, through um, mostly in France. It does leave France sometimes. It goes through both the Pyrenees and the Alps. It is a, a, a challenging race. You're probably familiar that the, the, lead, the leader of the race, so each day has a certain number of points associated with it, and the, the leader of points uh, gets to wear the yellow jersey to be the, the leader on the next day. And so once you get the yellow jersey, you'd fight to keep the yellow jersey and, and uh, keep riding on forward. The, there's a green jersey, and the green jersey is whoever won that day's stage. So the leader, the yellow jersey is a, is a, a compiled uh, times. The, yellow, the green jersey, rather, is the, is the sprinter's jersey, who won this day. And, and then there's a white jersey for the, the uh, best young rider, age 26 and under. But my favorite is the polka dot jersey. And it is white with red spots, big red spots. And it is the climber's jersey. It is whoever is winning in the compilation of the mountain climbs. There are certain stages along the way that are the really tough mountain climbs. And they, there are time trials along the way of those to see who is the best climber. 
one of the iconic climbs on Tour de France. Usually, it is more often than not on the climb, not on the race. The race route changes every year, so it's not always the same. But one of them is called Mount Mont Ventoux. Mont Ventoux is uh, really difficult because about halfway, a little more than halfway up, the vegetation has been stripped away of the mountain and it's just white limestone, uh, limestone rock and it's the middle of the summer and it is super hot, but the winds blow about 60 miles an hour. So they're climbing on this incredibly steep grade with the winds blowing and the heat just bearing down upon them. One of the uh, uh, climbers, a man named Paul Mondaire, writes this. The air is dry and scarce. The crosswinds can have you leaning your bike just to stay on two wheels. And the heat reflects off the merciless rocks. A cyclist should not fear the gradient, the heat, or the wind. He should fear the combination of all three. In a race, tactics are minimal here. By the last few kilometers toward the aptly named Storm Pass, there is only road, white rock, wind, and pain. Hmm. Has there ever been a place in your life where there is nothing but headwinds and pain? You know, it's, uh, we all face some really difficult times in our lives. Some of us more difficult than others, but all of us have those, those mountains. They call the wearer of the polka dot jersey the king of the mountains. I like the noble edge to the one who faces difficulties. One of my favorite, no, actually, my favorite sermon illustration of all time, and I've been doing this for 40 years, so my favorite, more than that, my favorite sermon illustration of all time, I reserve the right to use at least every five years. So um, I, I, may, I may be more often. I might use it next week. Who knows? Uh, but it, it goes this way. A man from New York is driving through the, the Deep South, and he stops for breakfast in Tupelo, Mississippi, at a diner there. And he goes in and he says, um, I'd like breakfast. And I'd, he orders uh, two eggs over easy and bacon and toast. And the waitress comes back and she brings him his breakfast and there's two eggs on it and there's bacon and there's toast. And then there's this white stuff. It's grainy white stuff with yellow butter floating in the top of it. And he says, ma'am, uh, what's that white stuff on my plate? And I wish I could do a New York accent, but I can't. He said, what's that white stuff on my plate? And, and she says, well, those are grits. And he says, grits? I didn't order grits. And she says, oh, honey, you don't order grits. Grits just comes. <laughs> you don't order hard times. Hard times just comes. So what can we learn in facing hard times from the kings of the mountains, the kings and queens of the mountains? I have four things I think that we can learn that these scriptures teach us. The, the first one is that <clears throat> kings and queens of the mountains realize they can do more than they ever thought they could. They realize, you know, I, I, if I were a biker, which I'm not, if I were riding along and there was a, a mountain there, I would look for some way around it. But you can't always go around the mountains, can you? It, it doesn't always work out that way. When I was, when I was uh, we were in our worship team talking about this sermon, um, Michelle Manuel and Julie Ellerbrock and a bunch, our children's director and a bunch of others launched into in just perfect unison some little song I had never heard before. I guess it comes from Girl Scouts or Campfire Girls or something. It goes this way. We're going on a bear hunt. We're going to catch a big one. What a beautiful day. We're not scared. Uh-uh. Oh, you even, some people even know it. They're doing it, the, the, the things with us. Uh-uh. Long, wavy grass. We can't go over it. We can't go under it. Oh, no. We've got to go through it. And then they do like swishy, 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 swishy. Everybody's got a different thing. Okay. So uh, you've got to go through it. You can't 
when you come to the mountains, you can't go over, the, I mean, you can't go around them. You got to go over them. You got to go through hard times. Here's what, here's what uh, often happens. Somebody goes through an incredibly difficult time, and in the midst of that in difficult time, somebody comes up to them, I'm, I would do this, and I say, I don't know how you're doing this. I don't know how you're doing this. You are an inspiration the way you're going through this. And they respond almost universally. I didn't know I had a choice. If I'd had a choice, I wouldn't have done it. I didn't know I had a choice. Because that's the way it is. So sometimes this passage of scripture is misunderstood and it really, uh, I think it's really important that we get the clarity. Paul is not seeking out suffering. When Paul says, I boast in my suffering, he's not seeking out suffering. Uh, this, this word that is there is boast in, in a Greek is kaukatomai, kaukatomai. And it, it literally, so sometimes it's one of those words that is translated by various translators a thousand different ways. So New International Version says, I rejoice in my sufferings. The, this one says, I boast in my sufferings. King James says, I glory in my suffering. The word means, I hold my head up. Literally, it comes from a word that means a strong neck that holds up one's head. I I, I, I like that picture. I hold my head up through my suffering. Because in the midst of it, God will get me through it. I will experience the power and presence of God holding me up, getting me through this. I don't boast in the suffering. I don't look for it. But I can trust that God will get me through it. I don't have a I don't really have a choice. The scripture we read today, listen to, with that picture in your mind, listen again to what, what he says. Uh, verse 2, he says, we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, in which all of these things are coming at us, all these hard times, I can stand up because I have the grace of God. Or verse 5, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. I can do this. Or from the Old Testament that we read, right? Those uh, even young, the young ones shall fall down exhausted, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Kate Bowler um, is a professor of history at Duke uh, Theology School, at Duke Seminary, and she is a young woman in her 30s. Uh, she, in 2015, was diagnosed with stage four colon cancer, uh, has a small child. Um, it, was, it was devastating. She wrote a book in 2018 um, called Everything Happens for a Reason and Other Lies I've Loved. And then she, uh, here, well, let me read to you what she writes. She talks about the presence of God and how, how you experience the presence of God. That feeling stayed with me for months. In fact, I had grown so accustomed to that floating feeling that I started to panic at the prospect of losing it. So I began to ask friends, theologians, historians, pastors I knew, and nuns I liked, what am I going to do when it's gone? And they knew exactly what I meant, because they had either felt it themselves or read about it in great works of Christian theology. St. Augustine called it the sweetness. Thomas Aquinas called it something mystical like the prophetic light. But all said, yes, it will go. The feelings will go. The sense of God's presence will go. But they offered me this small bit of certainty, and I clung to it. When the feelings recede like the tides, they said, they will leave an imprint. I would somehow be marked by the presence of an unbidden God. I may not feel good all the time, like this, you know, just always. When I talk to people who are going through hard times, they're honest about their anguish, sometimes about not feeling God's presence. But they know they've been marked 
by God's presence. Okay. Second thing, kings and queens of the mountains develop courage and grit for the next mountain stage. Right? They learn something on this mountain stage that they can use and develop on the next mountain stage. Um, one of St. Luke's members gave me a gift of a book by uh, Malcolm Gladwell called David and Goliath. Many of you might have read it. It's about various stories of small, uh, resisting big, uh, easy versus difficult. In fact, one of the sections of the book is called The Theory of Desirable Difficulty, right? It's not good when everything's easy. Well, um, the last story of the book is about a man named André Trocmé. He was a, a, a French pastor, and in the Second World War, after the Nazis uh, invaded France, they set up the Vichy regime, which was really a puppet government of, the, of uh, Hitler's uh, Nazism. And um, so they began to gather Jews and send them to the camps. Well, uh, he was this, this pastor in the south part of France, and he was part of a denomination called the Huguenots. And he lived in a small village, and uh, the village was almost all these people who were Huguenots. And this is a, a Protestant denomination that had separated from the Catholic Church uh, around the Protestant Reformation, but not in association with Luther. And in fact, what had happened was that over the centuries, the Huguenots had been persecuted incredibly. And in fact, there had been a, a genocide in the 1700s of the Huguenots. And so these were people who understood what it was like to be persecuted. Well, uh, Trochme and his friends said, they said, you know, this is wrong that this is happening. And so they said to all of the Jews in France, come to our village. And uh, they, they actually put ads in newspapers throughout France saying, Jews are welcome in our village. And people, and they came by the droves. Or initially, they, they hid them, but then they couldn't hide them anymore. There were so many of them. And, and so when the Vichy regime came calling, they sent a, a group of students out to meet the generals with the letter from Trochme and other leaders of the village. And it said in sort of, it was a much longer letter, but the last line of the letter was, we have Jews, you can't have them. We're not going to let you do this. The little school that Trochme may, uh, ran grew from 18 students to 350 students, almost all of them Jews. So he ultimately was um, arrested. He had to flee. He was chased down, used various aliases, but was arrested and um, exiled and ultimately exterminated. The, they interviewed his wife and said, why would you do this? Why would you put yourselves at risk this way? And they said, you don't understand. We're Huguenots. We know what it's like to be persecuted. So we never thought we wouldn't help. It was just, how could we help? Trachme himself, when he was asked, he said, my parents died when I was 10. My son took his own life. Nothing could be as bad as that. I can do anything now. I, I'm privileged to be on the board of Houston Methodist Hospital. and. Um, it, one of the things that happened in 2001 that you may know of, this was before I was on the board, uh, a tropical storm Allison came through Houston. You all remember that? It was bad. And in fact, here in St. Luke's, the whole basement was flooded and we lost power and there's about a million dollars in damage of equipment in our basement. Um, well, the same thing happened at the medical center. And in fact, the generators that were going to power the hospital in storms, where do we put them? They had been put in the basement. So th they were useless. And the whole, the whole hospital was without power. Well, the doctors and nurses and medical techs and administrative assistants and custodians picked up the patients on their gurneys and carried them down the steps. 17 floors on one place all the way down, waded through the water waist deep with them on their shoulders to put them in ambulances where they could be taken to hospitals where um, they could be cared for out 
out away from the medical center. What's so interesting is that became a defining moment for the hospital. They, they still claim today that that was the moment things changed at Houston Methodist Hospital in terms of the, the values that were driving them forward. And when the pandemic came, they said, we can do this. You remember what we did in 2001? You remember that? Right, we get, when, when we go through hard times, when you get to the other side, you look back on them and you say, man, I did that, I can do anything now. It builds, it, 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 um, it refines us, it builds metal. Not saying we look for it, don't misunderstand me, you don't, you don't hope for those things. All right, the third thing is, kings and queens of the mountain sometimes crash their bicycles. Everything doesn't go right. Just because you're trying hard doesn't mean you're going to be wildly successful. Here's one of the story I liked. I don't know if I liked it, but anyway. Stage 14, one of the mountain stages this year in the Tour de France. Michael Woods helped create the day's main breakaway on stage 14 of the Tour de France, but his chances of victory were hampered by a crash. However, he found consolation by taking the lead in the mountains competition and by pulling on the polka dot jersey. The Canadian hit the deck with 50 kilometers remaining when he slipped out on a gentle left-hand bend. He took the impact on his upper left leg, which ripped his shorts and left him with road rash. Woods was leading the 14-man breakaway at the time when Matteo Catanio, Catan anyway, uh, had to swerve to avoid him. None of the others were caught up. Woods quickly remounted and set about chasing back on, though he looked far from comfortable as the road continued to snake. So let me finish the point I was trying to make. Kings and queens of the mountain sometimes crash their bikes, comma, but they get back on them. See, we've been talking about perseverance, but there's a corollary to perseverance, and that's resilience. Right? Resilience says when you crash your bike, you get back on it. When terrible things happen, when it doesn't go well, when there's a setback, when there's a problem, you find a way to get back on your bike. Listen to what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians. But we have this treasure in clay jars, so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are afflicted in every way but not crushed, perplexed but not driven to despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed. Struck down but not destroyed. I confess that I was writing this sermon this week, and as I was writing it early in the week, I was watching the Astros. Games two and three. How could that happen? They were awful, awful. But then I got an illustration for my sermon, right? <laughs> and so now I can wear my Astro socks and to celebrate it, right? A resilience, right? And let me just say, I, I, I think the, the whole Astro's arc of the story is about resilience, right? Over the last five years. At some point you say, man, I kind of screwed up. I crashed my bike. I'm going to get back on it. Look, I'm going to spare you the stories about Abraham Lincoln losing like 10 elections before he was elected president. And I'm going to spare you the stories about Michael Jordan not making his varsity basketball team. But I do want to give you these stories. A couple who um, endured, no, experienced a extramarital affair in their, in their marriage, in their family. And the betrayal seemed like they could never get through it. But they worked, and they worked, and they worked. And they, it was not just a matter of, oh, you're forgiven. It was a matter of working to rebuild trust and, and staying at that and continuing to rebuild trust. And now I've been happily married more than 40 years. 
I can tell you the story about a woman whose husband died and her heart was broken and she thought she could never, ever love again. But she fell in love again. I can tell you the story about a friend of mine who battled with alcoholism and would, would be sober for three months and then fall off the wagon and be sober for three months and then fall off the wagon. And once he was sober for a year and then fell off the wagon again and just despair took over him. But now he's been sober for 20 years. Resilience means that you have setbacks and you do crash your bike, sometimes your own fault but you stay at it. All right, here's the last thing we learned from kings and queens of the mountains. Kings and queens of the mountains know that, that Paris is at the end of the race. Here's what I like about uh, the, the Tour de France. Um, stage 21 is pretty much ceremonial. And the, the, the leading, the yellow jersey team, it's a team sport thingy, the, the, the team of the yellow jersey wearer, uh, serves champagne to all the riders before the last day's race. Not after, but before the last day's race. So stay out of their way, in, right, as they come into Paris because they've been drinking. And uh, they come into town and they ride three times around the Champs Elysees, right? The, uh, you know what that means? It means the Elysian Fields. That's the famed street in Paris. But it means Elysian Fields, the Greek, under, the Greek uh, definition of paradise. We know that paradise is at the end of the race. We know that God has promised that God will put things back together again, that that which is unjust will be made right, that which is broken will be healed, that which is dead will be brought to life. And we have that picture in, ahead of us of that paradise. And so Paul can say, your work is not in vain, keep on, because this is what's at the end of the race. That's why Paul says, we have hope in sharing in the glory of God. The glory of God is that, that moment that we get to share in. We get to be a part of that. So let me just close with, with reading this passage. I invite you to maybe just close your eyes and listen. Listen to this picture of the scriptural Paris. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, see, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his people. And God himself will be with them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death will be no more mourning, crying, and pain will be no more. For the former things have passed away. And the one who sat upon the throne said, See, I make all things new. Gracious God, we confess we don't like the mountains. We don't like climbing the difficult times, the challenges that just overwhelm us sometimes. And yet in those times, we experience your presence in profound ways. We find ourselves getting stronger, developing metal for whatever comes towards us. And we discover that we can get back on our bikes and get back up again and keep moving. All because we have a hope a hope that you've promised us of what's ahead. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen.